If you had to leave your home uh, on a moment's notice and you could only take one object, one possession, what would that possession, what would that object be? It's a beautiful watch, a rolling pin, a piece of jewelry, my grandmother's china, this ring here that I'm wearing, a baby rattle, a penguin plush toy, it's an oil painting, a brooch, my ukulele. This project started as a community storytelling initiative. Sue Elliott was the director of education at Seattle Opera. We initially got the assignment in 2011. Sue came by my office and said, I'm looking for a librettist. I was given a broad concept which was belongings, and Sue told me that Seattle Opera had already begun a collaboration with Mohai. To gather stories in the community, they asked, what is your most precious belonging and what's the story behind it. Then our job from that was to listen to the stories, think about what might work on a stage. And how do we arrive, uh, you know, at a single story? We realized, okay, we really need to see if there are any stories that have resonances with one another. And then we spoke to the two people who ended up becoming the heroines of our story. We had so many beautiful stories, so many deeply felt stories. Marianne and Mary they were both in their 80s when I met them, and they both spoke of the importance of telling the truth so we don't repeat the past. I spoke first to Marianne Waltman. Her story, her possession that she brought forward was a book about her hometown, Stettin, um, which is a city north of Berlin. And she talked through some of her childhood memories of this town she left there because her family wanted to escape the Nazi threat. I also spoke with Mary Matsuda Grunwald. She had a jar of shells that she collected from the Tule Lake Detention Center where she and her family were incarcerated. She was a young teen when she was there and her mother was very perceptive and could see that her daughter was having a hard time and her mom suggested that they collect these shells and make something beautiful together to lift their spirits. felt like, okay, these, these are very different stories from the World War II period. What kind of electricity would happen if we put them in the same story? We decided, okay, these are the most compelling stories. There was a great deal of loss and suffering. There was racism. We took part of what was true of the experience of these women, but we really made a story that wasn't tied to their actual experience. An American Dream takes place during World War II in a home on an island off the coast of Seattle. It's a story of a Japanese American family who is forcibly removed and incarcerated during this period and another family moves into their home. Jim Crowley, who's Irish American, an American veteran, and his wife, Ava Crowley, who is a German Jew, who's worried about her family in Germany during this time. Ava does not know how Jim obtained this home, and she starts to discover who the family was that lived here. We have these two characters, one who was taken from her home in Germany in order to have a better, safer life. And a Japanese American girl who was taken from her home to be incarcerated and together, you know, this house becomes both of their homes. And so to see these two stories, you know, come together and to see how these two women impact each other, I think it's, it's really magical in a horrible way part of the story.
I think what's really important to say about an American dream is it's not just about a Japanese family. So the, the Jewish experience, Jewish immigrant experience, the Jewish German immigrant connection, I think is, is another big facet of it. The whole story is fiction. There are elements that are true. Mary Matsuda Grunwald did need to burn her family belongings. It's this really, really wrenching moment to think that you would have to burn your photographs of family members. But Setsuko is not Mary Matsuda Grunwald. That said, we had to make sure that it was true, a different kind of true. It had to be historically accurate to the time and to the collective experience of a number of people, both in the United States and immigrants from Germany. So there's my dad when he was a baby. He was born right after World War II. This was at the time when Japanese Americans weren't really getting hired to do much. We talk about belongings. This is one of the most special things. This was my great-grandmother Kyoka's chest that she brought with her to Poston when she was incarcerated. This was her number, number 34393. Everything that mattered to her came with her in this chest, including the clothes that she wore for the next two plus years. I was in my basement at this like kind of stand-up table when I got a call from my agent saying, hey, do you think you could go to Seattle in like a week or two? Seattle Opera is doing a workshop of a new piece. It's very specific. They need a low Asian mezzo and there aren't very many of them and you're one of the only ones who can sing some of these low notes. I realized that it was a story about Japanese American incarceration, which is my family's story. And I had no idea until I got to the workshop that that's what the story was. The character of Setsuko was 16, 17. My grandmother would have been the exact same age as Setsuko when she was incarcerated. And the character I play, Setsuko's mother, would have been my grandmother's mother, who I'm named after. And so all of a sudden, like, all of these things started to come together and I was like, this is like my story. From the very minute that I stepped foot into the workshop room, we were adding bits and pieces of my grandmother's story to it. That's my great-grandmother Kyoka, who I'm named after. If I think about in my own family, she's the one who I play in the opera. She never became a U.S. citizen because at the time, you had to take the U.S. citizenship test in English. And even if they did speak in English, they, they most of them didn't read or write in English. And so, you know, we talk a lot about the Japanese incarceration and the fact that a lot of these people were not American citizens, but the reason they weren't American citizens was because there was this barrier to entry for them. That generation of Japanese Americans didn't talk about what happened to them when they were incarcerated. After World War II, the Japanese American community was very much of the mindset of we are going to excel at everything we do. We're gonna be the best citizens we can possibly be. And so finally, in the like very late years in her life, she, um, they changed the law and she was able to take the citizenship test in Japanese. And um, at that point she became an American citizen. By the time it got to me, there was very little culture that had been passed down from, from the generations before incarceration. But in an interesting way, talking about these stories actually is a form of healing. You know, directing the piece, delving into the piece, showing the piece is a form of like healing for our community that in a way, when the stories are not told, they don't live. One of the things I love about An American Dream is how beautiful the music is. It's haunting and it evokes so many emotions. So 
So much of opera is about emotion. Oftentimes it's hard for us to speak about emotions, but when you add that extra level of music and of the voice, singing those emotions, I find is what really touches the heart. Opera works really well with huge emotions, huge stories, things that in a normal day we might not think we could tackle. I think that Jessica's libretto is a really brilliant investigation of the sadness of people being awful to each other. My approach, I was looking for almost like a clock that it would have motion in time and, and it would be moving forward and then all of these ideas and themes of the piece could be wrapped around that clockwork. You know, like it resolves to something that's so off, like, you know, it's either going to be there if it were like normal, so perhaps, or I don't know, but instead it's just kind of both. And there's a lot of that all through it. It's hard for me to describe the feeling I had the first time I heard the music and I heard singers and then I heard the orchestra layered in. There's no way to tell the story by yourself when you're working on an opera. You need everybody. You need everybody in the room. You need the singers with these magical voices. You don't really know the story you're telling until you hear the music because that composer's telling the story through music and then you finally hear what you are actually a part of. You have five minutes of a prologue where you're basically flying over the Seattle area. It's just this like gorgeous music that is so expansive. The opera has largely stayed the same since 2015. Both Marianne and Mary were at the world premiere. And that felt like a huge responsibility, but it felt like a huge honor that they were, both of these strong women were in the audience, part of the experience of this opera. That's opening night of the world premiere with me and my grandma and then Norm Mineta. My grandma was so excited to meet him. <laughs> One of my favorite things at the end of the opera, it ends kind of really quietly. And because it's contemporary and most people haven't ever seen it before, people aren't sure if it's over or not yet. And you have this collective silence. There is so much magic in those few seconds of silence before the audience comes together and applauds, where you feel the impact that you've just created on the people in front of you. I remember one audience member approached me after her family had been put in the detention centers incarcerated during World War II. She knew the story, she knew the facts, right? And she said, I'm gonna get emotional thinking about it. She said, I felt it for the first time today. And she started crying and we embraced. And I don't know her name. I don't know anything beyond that reaction, but that feels so powerful and important. And I think I'm a little surprised that I was part of something like that. And it seems to really touch people and that it's really, been in a, like a, a remarkable journey and I'm so grateful for it. It's a powerful, beautiful story that I think is going to live on for a very, very long time. In the Japanese community, we have this saying that's never again. And the only way that we can ever make sure that this never happens again is by educating and by talking about it. Because if we don't know about it, there's no way to know what can't happen again. It's through art like this that we're learning and talking about humanity and history.